Hi, everyone. My name is Tina Costa. I'm one of the directors from the PHSA Office of Virtual Health. I'm continuing to be your virtual host today. My pleasure to welcome you or re-welcome you to day two of the 2023 BC Digital Health Forum. For those of you just joining into our virtual circle, we encourage you to share in our collective gratitude for the opportunity to come together from many traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of BC First Nations. As we continue to engage, learn, and collaborate in the realm of digital health, let us give thanks for the privilege to do so on these beautiful sacred lands. And may our discussions contribute to a future where Indigenous voices are uplifted and the principles of reconciliation guide our path forward. I now have the pleasure of introducing our next presenter, Brent Parker. Brent works at PHSA as legal counsel with the corporate, commercial, and healthcare legal team. In his role with PHSA, he regularly advises on matters related to digital health, including in the areas of privacy, intellectual property, data protection, and research. His career as a lawyer includes experience in both public and private legal practice settings and is complemented by over 12 years of experience in project management, mainly in the health sector. In addition to his legal training, Brent holds a master's in public health and post-grad training in data and analytics. Thanks so much for joining us today, Brent, for your talk on data protection and legal obligations. Over to you. Perfect. Well, thank you for the introduction. It's uh, great to be here. My colleague, uh, Sibylla Valdivicio, also had anticipated to be here this afternoon, but uh, was called away to an urgent matter and so sends her, her regrets. But uh, I'll, I'll carry it forward on my own, I suppose. So I recognize that a, a land acknowledgement was uh, previously uh, made, and uh, today I'm calling from the traditional and unceded territories of the Silex Nation in the Okanagan Valley. Um, I, I acknowledge with gratitude the, the lands that I am on. For today, I wanted to provide a brief overview of three areas, uh, one being the role that we as lawyers, uh, specifically lawyers for health authority, are uh, how we're involved in digital health projects. Uh, secondly, I'm hoping to provide a brief overview of uh, the ways in which uh, we're involved at both project level as well as that organizational level, and uh, specifically within the organizational level, the roles and activities that are taking place uh, currently within PHSA, within other health authorities, to support uh, data protection, to help manage our uh, legal obligations for these digital health uh, projects. And finally, um, I'll, I'll be providing a few key updates that are relevant uh, as of the last couple of years in this area as well. So uh, they'll be especially relevant for individuals working uh, uh, in the health authority, but as well as those that are working uh, with health authorities as collaborators, uh, because it's helpful to know the obligations that, uh, that your partners, that your collaborators are subject to as well. And so within the world of uh, digital health, uh, we as legal counsel are involved in a number of different areas. Uh, here's just seven that I had the chance to list out briefly. Uh, you know, of course, regulatory compliance, data privacy and security, those are probably that and the contractual uh, agreement side of things are probably the top that come to mind. But intellectual property, policy developments, conversations like these, those are other areas in which uh, we routinely find ourselves uh, spending time uh, engaging in dialogue, uh, further supporting and developing. And so specific to compliance data protection, uh, there's really, I think, two areas by which we, uh, we spend our time. One at a project level for a given initiative, let's say, and then secondly, uh, at more of an organizational level. I'm gonna go through each of these uh, in a bit more detail here now with uh, just a brief project example that's illustrative of uh, many of the types of projects uh, and, and the general themes that we might be experiencing in and around the work that we do uh, for digital health. So let's imagine there's a new platform that's being considered within a hospital setting or outpatient setting. 
It's a platform. It allows uh, patients to uh, manage and control their health data that's collected by them by some application. So through this, through this, it's it's a great technology. Uh, patients can uh, they can access their information to monitor their health status. Uh, they can also share information uh, to perhaps their healthcare providers, uh, employees of a health authority, um, and they can add comments to these records as well um, if, if they see relevant, or maybe to to help support uh, further knowledge about a, a given analytic, uh, uh, a given a given clinical uh, response uh, that's being measured. So this really does foster collaborative approach to to healthcare. I think. The audience here is familiar with these types of technologies, I, I, I presume, um, and uh, this is this is the work that we all do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, in this example, and in the work that we do, often we're looking at how do we balance control and responsibility. And and as lawyers, we're, we're involved in these conversations quite regularly. We're looking for how do we implement a tool like this in a way that respects patients' rights while maintaining the integrity and security of the healthcare information. We certainly don't want cases to arise where a patient can too easily uh, disclose data, sensitive data of their own, accidentally, inadvertently, um, or without the proper security controls being in place. But we want to facilitate a means by which they can do so if that is their intent and that is the purpose of, or one of the purposes of the initiative. And so in an initiative like this, uh, we're often involved in working with the stakeholders, the, the project management team, maybe it's the third party vendor that's supporting this, um, other stakeholders to review things like, what does the consent say? What is when an individual joins on to this technology, uh, what do they have to understand about the technology, about how information is shared. We spend a lot of time on these conversations and uh, these are really important. I know sometimes when you look through the forms when you're you know, signing off on a new technology or you just get a new software yourself personally, it's click, 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 and you're trying to get onto the next, but that process so that the individual understands what rights they have, the access that they have to information and their responsibilities for it, is very important. Uh, we also look at you know, data custodianship, data ownership, who's responsible for what. Certainly if, if there's a third party vendor, they're going to have responsibilities and how they might manage the data, how they might allow access to their service providers, us, where the data is hosted, all that type of thing. We, if, if it's uh, us, the health authority, we're gonna have responsibilities as to how information is managed make sure that we're in compliance with FIPA, if there's any limitations as to how the data might be shared internally or externally for, let's say, for example, research. Those are all things that are going to have to be contemplated. And then, of course, any work that we do, whether it's uh, drafting of consent forms, uh, drafting of uh, service agreements, statements of work, we're going to have to ensure that all of those relationships and, and contracts that they comply with relevant laws, especially the privacy laws. So that's an illustrative example of, uh, of a specific initiative that we might be involved in, um, that we are involved in on, on a regular basis. The other area that we support is at an organizational level to allow for broader infrastructure to exist to support these, uh, these digital projects. One of the most relevant of which, and uh, for anyone that works in the area of privacy is very familiar with, is the work that's been happening over the past couple of years in and around uh, privacy management programs. And so this is a new requirement uh, under our privacy legislation, FIPA. Uh, it, it came into, this requirement it came into a force here at the, the beginning of this year. And it requires a health authority, it requires any public institution to have privacy management program, which includes these elements which are listed. Um, and so 
our teams have been working, especially the, pri the privacy, but also legal and, and several other teams have been working very hard over the last year to ensure that we have a very structured and formal program in place that include these components. Now, I recognize there's a number of different types of individuals, individuals within different backgrounds. Um, some of you may be uh, working within and at go other government uh, organizations. Some of you might not be subject to uh, FIPA, you might be subject to PIPA. Uh, certainly some of the requirements that are set out here uh, are relevant to uh, you know, any organization that's dealing with sensitive data. And so I would really encourage uh, you to consider whether it's within your specific organization, uh, your specific department, uh, whatever that may be, uh, for you to consider these types of essential uh, factors in the work that you do. Um, and uh, so briefly, um, be aware of the legal obligations that you have. Uh, certainly, you know, there, there's going to be privacy legislation that might be applicable, but there, in the work that you do, uh, if it's dealing with sensitive information, there might be anti-spam law, uh, you know, legislation that's out there that you need to consider. Um, depending on the structure of your organization, uh, where you do work, there might be other laws that are relevant that are above and beyond the laws of just British Columbia. Uh, cybersecurity, I, I'm probably not the person to be speaking about that. There's probably other experts uh, here on the call that, uh, that are very aware of uh, the needs for, uh, for this, but where, where legal get involved in is, is when things go wrong. And so I can't say enough how important uh, cybersecurity measures are to reduce our risk of inadvertent disclosures. Uh, and, and, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Breach response plans, another key um, activity that is very important. And so if you don't know if your organization has a breach response plan, ask your relevant director, manager, the CEO, whoever that person might be that, that does and uh, does know about that and, and, and at least have an awareness of what to do if things do go wrong as far as initial steps go. Increasingly, especially within the work that we do here uh, in, in digital health, there's expectations for uh, the technology to both have capacities to audit, track, and monitor usage, and for those to actually be implemented as well, too. And so these are essentials. Perhaps, uh, you know, one other area that there has been uh, some changes in the last uh, year here in British Columbia for public organizations is around breach reporting. And so I do want to spend a few minutes talking about that. So let's go back to our, our example. So despite robust security measures that were in place for this, uh, this uh, data platform, this this uh, app that perhaps is being used by patients to uh, share their information. There is, uh, there's identified a, a compromise of information. Legal counsel were notified, privacy is notified, the other relevant stakeholders uh, internally are notified, and there's an assessment as to, okay, what do we do? What do we do now? And so, uh, if you're going to sum it up in four words, four bullet points, this really highlights uh, the, you know, the best practice. Contain, investigate, and assess risk, notify and report, prevent. And so uh, your breach response plan should consider uh, these areas. Uh, this, is, this is essential. On the uh, reporting side of things, that's what I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes talking about here. So. As of, uh, as of this, uh, this year, uh, there is mandatory notification and reporting, uh, that being notification to the affected individuals and reporting to the Privacy Commissioner's Office uh, in circumstances where there, a, a, a disclosure uh, of privacy breach has the potential to result in significant harm. The Act, it lays out what significant harm uh, means, uh, the bullet points are summarized there, uh, but uh, briefly, I will say that, well, this is a new area for, for us in BC, 
other provinces have taken a relatively uh, low threshold um, for its their definition of significant harm. And so that is you know the, the general approach that that I think is is the guidance here these these days. And so if there is a breach of information, of personal information, and it's determined that notification is required, there's a few steps that are required to be taken under the new, uh, the new processes, the new updated uh, legislation. So this uh, requires uh, generally uh, that it be given to the affected individual in writing, uh, the specifics of the incident uh, be provided, contact information from the organization, uh, clarification as to whether the Privacy Commissioner's Office has been notified, steps taken uh, to mitigate the risk of harm, as well as uh, steps an individual may take. Now, this is the general uh, guidance uh, here as far as uh, what to include in a breach notice. It, it is generally to be given to the affected individual. However, there are some circumstances in which uh, public notification uh, may be uh, provided. Uh, this is this is really just a, a very brief uh, high-level overview of the breach re reporting uh, requirements uh, under FIPA. Certainly, if you have further questions um, around the specifics of it, uh, you can you can ask your uh, privacy uh, team lead, your the, the privacy department, depending which organization you're you're working with, um, about the particulars of of this, and uh, they'll be able to provide a lot more detail. Um, certainly, if you're, you're concerned that you may have a, a compromise, uh, you know you should be reaching out to your privacy uh, team uh, immediately. So, you know, to summarize, uh, legal departments, uh, PHSA legal department, health authority legal departments, were involved in many different aspects of this. Uh, this work around digital health, uh, both on a project by project basis, but well as well as at an organizational level. Uh, there are uh, several recent updates that have come into force over the last uh, over the last year, particularly the uh, requirement for a privacy management program, as well as some additional uh, breach reporting or rules. Um, and so uh, I just did want to leave on this last thought that is, uh, it's hard to sometimes, it's hard to sometimes, uh, you know, we get into the, the nitty gritty of the contracts, or for those of you working with the actual data side of things, you're looking at, you know, huge data files, but it, it's, it's helpful to sometimes just remember that behind this work that we do is the individual, right? Behind each data point is a story. Uh, part of somebody's life, part of their health and well-being, and uh, I find that helps to uh, to ground me. So I recognize here I have about maybe five five six minutes uh, left for questions. I'd be happy to uh, take any. I know that there's a chat here, um, and would certainly uh, can I look to that if there are any specific questions um, related to this presentation, related to. Uh, generally, you know, the work that takes place uh, with uh, with legal departments uh, at health authorities, um, obligations that organizations such as uh, a health authority are, um, uh, do have any, anything of that nature. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in, but just want to say thank you for this conversation today. Uh, I don't think I understood truly before I entered the world of digital health how critical privacy and legal conversations, those critical elements are to the success of this type of transformation in healthcare. So really appreciate the learning that yourself and the legal teams do to ensure that there are safety and that we as healthcare providers understand those true risks from a technology perspective and how to handle them if there is say a breach as you've mentioned and love this slide so much. I definitely, that'll resonate with me. Couple of questions coming up. The first one is, what is in place to ensure new staff are informed of the obligation to undertake privacy impact assessment on new projects 
initiatives or major changes. There's a second part to it, but I'll maybe let you answer that first. Sure, sounds good. So I think this question really does uh, depend on the organization uh, that the new staff is, uh, is joining. Um, here within PHSA, we have a number of uh, policies in place that are relevant to, uh, to privacy, to, to legal departments, as well as to intellectual property. And so I think anybody that is working in this area, so this area of digital health, they should review those policies. So specifically, I mean, there, there's going to be more of them, but, you know, off the top of my head, the ones relating to privacy, the ones relating to um, interaction with legal legal services and when to and when they must, legal services must be consulted, and as well as the intellectual property uh, policies. I, I believe that all health authorities have policies. Don't quote me on this. I believe most, if not all, uh, health authorities have policies on this or that are, you know, that cover these areas. And so that would be a very essential thing uh, for consideration for a new employee. There was a part two to that question, I believe. There was. Thank you for remembering. Part two is, are there audits done to ensure that new systems or solutions have undergone privacy impact assessments? So there are processes in place to review. Um, so I'm not, so uh, there's a there's our legal department and then there's our privacy department. I don't work for the privacy department. And so they're gonna be more up to speed on uh, the specific processes in place. But I do know that there are reviews that are taken uh, regularly. The extent to which that happens and uh, is, is something that I'm not clear about. But I'd be happy to uh, provide to that person if they're if they're a PHSA um, employee uh, further particulars of who they might be able to contact within our organization uh, if they have specific questions about that. Sounds great. Next question is in relation to a PIA or a privacy impact assessment, and wondering if that PIA covers recommendations to consult with the legal team if necessary. Sure. So we have a very close relationship with our privacy department. And from what I've observed with the other health authorities um, that exists across the board. So certainly um, I am regularly interacting with our director of, uh, of privacy and the various um, privacy officers that do these PIAs. And so they know, you know, I wouldn't say they're they're on my favorite five with with my with my phone and uh, but you know they're they're definitely um, on my on my speed dial and, and vice versa and so we regularly get consulted um, with them on questions that may arise. They're very you know these these privacy officers and, and our director in this area is very uh, aware of the relevant laws, but they, they, they don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, legal if there's specific questions. And that, that sometimes happens in a way where the relevant project stakeholders, so like the project manager and, 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 and program director of the relevant area are looped in, but it also happens sometimes behind the scenes just for you know, the clarity of, of a quick question, maybe related to a compliance detail or an interpretation of, a, you know, an appropriate use of the data. And so the, the you know, we, we don't need to, you know, bore the, the, the pro program manager in every instance uh, of, of all those details and then side conversations, but that does happen regularly. Great. The next question sort of uh, bridges on your comment around the clinical program team. Uh, question is, when a team or department is considering implementing new communication methods with patients, who holds the responsibility for setting up the privacy measures? Is that the clinical staff, the organization, the vendor or company developing the software? Right. No, that's a really good question. And so anytime a new technology is being considered, um, I think it's important to speak to the relevant stakeholders at our so the, the relevant organization so so often that will involve typically that will involve uh privacy if it because it, it will be a new program so there may need to be at least a preliminary assessment as to whether or not 
A privacy impact assessment may be needed. Often, if it's a new technology, it will be needed. Um, and so that would be a great place to start that conversation. Otherwise, um, you know, certainly there are sometimes technologies that have already been vetted. And so again, going to a centralized source like the privacy department might help to determine whether or not there's another department, for example, within the organization that is already using the technology. And you know, those, those, those linkages can be made uh, to facilitate you know, enabling that process. Great, thanks. Brent, we've got one last question, and it's an interesting one, um, maybe coming from a patient partner perspective or a family perspective specifically. If a family has representative agreement over a patient and the patient themselves isn't doing well, either uh, for mental health concerns or possibly cognitively, and the patient themselves disagrees around sharing of the information, or really what happens in that case? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, the classic legal response that you're going to get in a question like that is it does depend on the circumstances. Certainly, when those conversations happen, it is important and valuable to have uh, conversations with the clinical staff, especially, uh, for example, if there is a physician involved in the care of uh, that individual. So there may need to be capacity related questions. Does this individual have the ability to make decisions on their own? Or is that representative the best person to be making and supporting that decision making? Certainly, you know, if there are further concerns and the things are not able to be resolved at that, you know, level with the clinical staff, uh, PHSA legal or the re respective legal departments with the other health authorities, they can get involved in those conversations. And it's not infrequent for us to help support those so that we can help you know, that patient and that patient's family or representatives uh, make the best decisions given where that individual's health is at. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brent, for your time, for a great presentation. Really appreciate it. We will close this session now and bring up the poll for a bit of feedback. And as we continue on our day, we'll invite everybody to our next session entitled Human Factors, Artificial Intelligence and Safety. Looking forward to seeing you there and you can continue to click on the, the session title on your panel left-hand side to meet us there in a couple of minutes. Again, thank you, Brent. Thank you.